Well, morning, everyone. Thank you very much to uh, the OSVEG committee for putting together a, a great conference, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I've been very fortunate over the last 18 years with Dow to experience um, a lot of agriculture around the world, to work with different farmers in different markets, and that's a perspective which is very valuable when um, we get to the topic that I'm going to discuss today. Um, it's, a, it's a real privilege here to represent Dow AgroSciences to the horticultural industry, which is a really important and critical industry for us and our products. Chris, one of the previous presenters this morning, worried me when he said resistance management is not a very sexy topic, knowing that I was about to talk about it for 30 minutes um, immediately afterwards. But it may not be sexy, but we do recognise its importance. And what I'm going to talk about today, a little bit different to Chris, is more of the corporate perspective of resistance management. And when you think about resistance, not just to insecticides, it's really pervasive across so many decisions that we make at the research and development level, at the corporate level, right through the industries and right down to the farmer level. And the key message from this speech and, and this, this discussion really is there is a, a caution that we need to be aware of, and that is that new technology, new innovation is not always just going to keep coming for us. But there is some optimism at the end that through really good programs, very good coordination, a lot of the things that Chris actually talked about this morning, that all is not lost and sustainable agriculture in horticulture and all crops can continue in a very, very good way. These are some of the topics that I'm going to cover today. So this is a somewhat dramatic slide. Um, I appreciate that. But we call this the Innovation Cemetery. And this is a very large cemetery with many, many gravestones. But I've just pulled out a few, a few of the examples that, that you might recognize. Um, when you look at some of those examples, and we'll, we'll talk about them briefly in a little bit more detail, the thing that you recognize is that when you're dealing with nature and evolution, there is no discrimination. It doesn't matter which country you're in, which crop you're in, what the pest is or what the product is. Nature will always catch up with you if you're not careful. And we've got some really nice examples here across multiple industries. If you look at the top left, phosphine was a fantastic and still remains a great product for the control of grain borer in stored grain. But over time, with overuse, the effectiveness of that product was reduced. And that industry had to respond with ro rotation programs and new initiatives to keep that project alive and that product alive. Outside agriculture into human health, probably one of the most documented issues and areas around resistance is that of antibiotics to bacteria, a huge social and health issue all around the world. And we've seen over time the effectiveness of antibiotics reduce to various bacteria. There's been a very strong response from this from the pharmaceutical industry and also from the human health industry around education and awareness to make sure that we don't create a greater problem in this very serious situation. Probably the most pressing crisis is a strong word, but situation with antibiotics at the moment is in China, where the Chinese government is dealing with a huge population of growing affluence, therefore wanting greater human health and they risk a, a really severe case of overuse of antibiotics. And I know the Chinese government is working very heavily on this right now. Top right, one closer to Australia. Herbicides are, are not discriminated here either. Sulfonylureas, metsulfuron, chlorsulfuron, fantastic products in Australian cereals used for many years, unfortunately overused and um, ended up with some efficacy concerns. And that's the same case in the Midwest of the US and it's the same case in Argentina. Fungicides are not left out of the cemetery either. The azol fungicides, particularly we see in, um, in Europe, very effective products for diseases like septoria. Overuse and overexposure has led to decreased efficacy. And if we look across fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides are probably the group whose, whose um, life cycle has shortened the most because of overexposure, especially in, in the European market. And then the bottom, run, bottom right one, one that's really close to my heart, I, I started my career in the cotton industry um, in Moree um, in the late 90s, and that, that was an industry that was on its knees at the time, really struggling to control heliothus and helicoverpa. Um, and one of their key tools, synthetic pyrethroids, were really struggling to form, um, provide effective and very reliable control. But it's a great story of an industry coming together and coordinating IPM programs based on the launches of new active ingredients to really come out the other end with a sustainable industry. So we recognize that nature doesn't discriminate and resistance is pervasive across everything. But what you can see here is that the behaviors in each of these industries was very common to lead to the problems that, that were encountered. Things like the overuse 
of products, overexposure and overreliance on single chemistries, low doses, poor, um, poor identification of the target pest and poor product cho choice. So the good news about having common behaviours is we know what we shouldn't be doing and we correct, can correct our behaviour. And um, there is a, the good news out of this is that there is the chance to resurrect products. And almost every product up there still has some practical fit and can still be used because industries and pharma groups around the world have responded. So there is a good news story out of the end of this. A very simple slide that shows over the last 70 years the, the size of the problem that this industry faces with insecticide resistance. We have up to 550 insect species that have either um, have recognized resistance to either one or multiple insecticides. It's an interesting shape of that curve. That line is really very rapidly growing up to the 80s and then it starts to sort of flatline over the last 10 to 15 years, and there's speculation about why that is. Some might say it's because of growing awareness to IPM programs and rotation has started to improve the problem. Others might say we're just sort of topping out on the main economically damaging species, and they're the ones that have been targeted and overexposed for the last 60 or 70 years. The bottom line, insecticides, number of insecticides with documented resistance, that line continues to grow as well. So you drill down really into the insecticide space and you look at what are the insecticides around the world that seem to be having the biggest problems. And you can see a long list there. Most of them will be familiar to you. Some of them will be pests that you have to deal with either yourselves or through your customer base. The ones in red are the ones that are most relevant to the Australian market. Um, diamondback moth, green peach aphid, cotton bollworm or helicoverpa, western flower thrip and coddling moth. So we see these pests everywhere. Um, but what is it about these insects that make them more likely to become resistant? And there's a couple of attributes that are consistent across this group of insects. They all have rapid cycle times of reproduction in high progeny. Um, ecology is very important. Do they migrate or do they stay local is a very important attribute about how quickly they will develop resistance. But I think the most important one, and any of you involved in, in, in agriculture would recognise, these are the pests that cause us most damage. So these are the pests that we treat the most. These are the ones that get repeat exposure because these are the ones farmers can't afford to allow to survive in large populations in their fields because it will lead to economic and yield and productivity downsides. And those ones, are, the, the key ones we see in Australia are things like diamondback moth, uh, a pest many would be very familiar with, green peach aphid, one that the canola industry in South Australia and southern states is struggling with at the moment, and heliothus is one I talked about already in terms of the, the cotton industry. There are thousands of case studies about resistance, and um, we've already heard some this morning, so I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but I, I did want to just pick one because it's, it's relevant to one of our products and to a pest that's relevant to Australia, um, and that is Western flower thrip. We, we have a, um, a chemistry called spinosad, trademark success, um, and it's very good on western flower thrip. The problem is there's not a lot of other chemistries that are really good on western flower thrip, so there is the tendency for this product to be overused. And here's an example for Cal in California in 2007 with chrysanthemums, where you can see the farmer was having difficulty controlling um, western flower thrip. Some um, samples were taken, bioassays done, and lo and behold, it was found that the LC50 was extremely high higher, in fact, in the label rates of the product. So we know straight away there's a problem there with the, product, with the product and its likely efficacy on that population. Records would have indicated that this farmer has been using label rates, haven't, hasn't overused the product particularly. But one thing we know about Western Flower Thrip is it's very mobile. So resistance can actually just pop up. You don't actually need to generate it yourself on your own farm. Um, and that was really the, the situation this farmer faced. We talked a little bit about cultural elements of resistance management, and this case study highlights a few of those. Um, there wasn't a great deal of coordination on this particular farm about how he was applying or she was applying the product between the shade farms and sequential applications. Smonosid was also used on adjacent fields, so increasing the, the exposure and the potential buildup of tolerance and resistance. And a pretty simple cultural practice wasn't, wasn't undertaken, and that is cleaning out weeds between the houses, which obviously were acting as a bridge or a harbour for western flower thrip, and therefore increase, increasing the, the pressure. So what was, the, um, what was the recommendation? The recommendation was the grower stop using the product. It's not easy for a grower to stop using an effective product, but in this case a program was put together um, whereby the product was rested for a couple of years. You can see the next year, um, in July 2008, 
the tolerance is still extremely high to spinosad. And then test done in uh, February 2010, you see the number going right back down to 0 0.05. This is a really extreme case. You wouldn't typically see insect populations recover as quickly as this, and it's something to do um, with, with, I said, the, mo the mobility and regeneration of western flower thrip. But if you go back to the innovation cemetery, I think this is a great example that with the right practices and the right programs, products don't die, they just have to be managed and they need to be managed well to last for longer periods of time. So how's the industry responded? We heard this morning very clearly about how, um, say, the, the Bowen industry has responded. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how corporate research and development companies have responded to this challenge. You need coordination in all of these events. Um, and particularly in insecticide resistance management, there's a great deal of coordination that occurs between the major multinational research and development companies on a technical basis to work together to provide resistance management guidelines for farmers and industries all around the world. So these are the major global companies involved in research and development. They're either developing new products or working on existing combinations of products. But these companies all work together to try and create guidelines that can help farmers understand the chemistry that they are using and extend the lifestyle of those products. Many of you have seen this, and this is one of the outputs of IRAC, and Chris touched on it this morning. This highlights, it's one thing to use one product, but you need to understand its mode of action, because other products have similar modes of action. So breaking them into categories like this is very important, so farmers really recognize which mode of actions they should be using and not overusing one mode of action too much. For us, as a research and development company investing in new products, New, new mode of action is priority one when we're trying to find new herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. And you can imagine, obviously, why new mode of actions are critical for the sustainability of that product and therefore the return on the investment, but also for the farming community in, in providing new modes of actions and new groups for agricultural industries to use around the world. So this is an interesting slide, and actually the, the presentation just before the break that didn't happen sort of touched a little bit on this. If you look at the history of product launches, and this is insecticides just specifically, you can see a lot of insecticides have been launched over the last 70 years. It really peaked in the mid-80s, and since then we've seen a really rapid decline in the number of new insecticide compounds released into the global market. And the obvious question is, what's going on? And there's a couple of culminating factors happening there. Um, the presentation before the break was very clear in raising one of the largest ones, and that's social awareness and social challenges around pesticides in general, but particularly insecticides, is changing the regulatory framework for, for companies. So it's becoming harder to find compounds that can um, meet the rigorous regulatory requirements of the day. And we're all in favor of that. We think that's important that our products are safe and can be used um, comfortably in the environment. But there is a downside to that, and that is it's becoming harder and harder to find compounds that meet those regulatory requirements. The IPM needs have changed the way we look for chemistries. Um, as Chris said this morning, farmers want targeted products that control targeted pests. Broad spectrum products really aren't registered or developed anymore. So that narrows the view once again. We also have to take into account much more um, in our considerations, things like food chain and residues, because your crops and your produce needs to be clean and needs to be safe for, for consumption. And then it was touched on also other social and political issues like bees is also putting added pressure on the regulatory environment, especially around pesticides. So I guess for an analogy of the needle in the haystack, when you're looking for new insecticides, the needle is just getting smaller and smaller all the time. And that's one of the key reasons why we're seeing less insecticides being commercialized and developed. There's another, there's another piece of information on this graph that's relevant. You see the lines. There are also less companies out there looking for new products. So the Japanese line is the blue line. The Japanese, has been, Japanese r and industry has been a powerhouse of looking for new chemistries for a long time, but there's consolidation happening there. And um, in the US and um, European R&D community, that consolidation is also happening. And everyone in the room is aware of the amount of consolidation talk that's happening, happening right now in, in agriculture. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But the message here is relatively simple. It, it is getting harder and harder to develop new products. Insecticides are probably the most difficult because of some of the issues I just touched on. And for you as farmers or um, people looking after farmers, the management of the life cycle of those products and protecting those, 
products is incredibly important, especially around resistance. You've all seen these slides before, but they're, they're important and they tell a story, um, particularly around the consolidation story. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, cost to develop new products on average, that's just on average. It's probably more expensive for insecticides and fungicides because of the diversity of crops into which you have to sell those products. Um, has doubled up to almost $300 million. And the time to take to register is 11 years. And it's, it's got longer because the regulatory requirements are greater, so it takes companies like ours longer to develop the data. And the regulators also want to take some more time making sure they're extremely comfortable with those dossiers and that data that's been submitted. So there's an extension. And if there are any finance people in the room, you can imagine the, the challenge of creating a positive NPV where you dig a hole and put $300 million into it over 11 years and then start to try and make money out to, for a positive return. It's, it's a huge risk, and it's only one that large companies can bear. And that's the hard and honest truth about this. And we've seen that in the pharmaceutical industry. Their story is, is even worse. It's almost 800 million to develop new active ingredients in the pharmaceutical segment. So the risks for companies, multinational R&D companies, is significant. And scale and consolidation is a must to develop new technologies into agriculture. Moving away a little bit from, from corporate ag into more industry ag, this is, a, this is a complicated slide, but it's actually pretty simple. These are all the decisions that farmers have to make before every product choice they choose. Price, spectrum, performance, spray programs, effectiveness. What I like about this slide is that every single one of those individual decisions should take into account how is this decision affecting resistance management. Price is a key one. It's often so easy for farmers to take a cheap option and overuse that and create a problem. But all of these individual choices, every choice has an element for where resistance management should be, should be considered. And I don't want to dwell too much on this because Chris touched on this really well in terms of IPM. I would just say from my personal experience, having traveled um, to most countries and looked at agriculture, Australia is really well in front in terms of adoption and awareness of IPM. And, and we should be. We're an educated community, we're literate, we're consolidated, and generally, generally, we make money, um, and we're well coordinated. And we are certainly leading the world in IPM, and that's critical in terms of longevity and sustainability of technology. And there's many, many good examples of IPM in, in, the, in this country. Um, but I think Chris touched on it well with his jigsaw puzzle. You know, it takes coordination, and that's why IPM in some countries, China, India is just so difficult. You've got small farmers that are literate, they're not making money, they're self-sufficient, they don't have good access to good technology. It's, it's very, very difficult to, to construct a good coordinated IPM approach in those types of geographies. We don't have that excuse, so we really should be leading the world in, in IPM. Um, and IPM crosses all, all boundaries, disease, weed, and insect management. And we talked a little about some of the cultural practices before, crop rotation. Um, green bridges are very important in Brazil. It's now legally mandated that between soybean crops, you cannot allow soybean plants to survive in that field. That's a law, because they don't want any live soybean plants in that field through the fallow to carry Asian rust. So we've seen some really extreme examples where resistance management is taking on almost a legal entity. Um, and, and that's very important for the Soybean Association and also for the soybean government, uh, the government in, in Brazil. We've talked about rotating insecticides already. Resistant cultivars, there was a question about that this this morning, and that's, that is an interesting one. There is a lot of natural breeding options for resistant cultivars, but we also can't ignore the GM options that do come um, in terms of plant-resistant cultivars. And there are some great stories. The cotton industry in Australia, I think, is one of the best stories where, where um, GM, GM cotton really saved an industry and has made it sustainable. There are some terrible stories. Roundup Ready soybeans in Argentina has brought about the resistance of glyphosate in a way that no one ever imagined. So it's not the solution, it's part of a coordinated approach. So selfishly, I'm going to dig into Dow Agrosciences just for a few minutes. Um, you've, you, many of you have seen these, these slides. Every company shares these at shareholder and analyst reviews, or they're put into annual reports. But they're really important in terms of what is a company's R&D engine delivering. And this is a view of ours. You can see above the line there the, the new molecules that are being launched over the last five years. And I'm not going to go into detail about the molecules, because every R&D every company has a slide like this. I'm going to talk more about what it means. They are the products coming out now that were looked at and being discovered 15 to 20 years ago. The nice thing for us is we have one coming out each year, 
Everyone above the line is a new mode of action. So I talked about before the importance of new modes of action. That is gold to companies like us. To have new mode of action in those segments is absolutely critical. The ones with the stars, by the way, are ones that are relevant to Australia. Not every new compound that's discovered actually has a good market fit in Australia. We love them too, but they don't, they don't all fit. Thankfully for us, most of the new ones do. But if you're a historian, and I love history, these slides are a window in time looking back 15 to 20 years about what were companies like Dow thinking the future looked like. Where should we invest our, at the time, $150 million to get a return on that investment? So 15 years ago, we didn't think there was a future in herbicides because of Roundup Ready. We thought Roundup Ready was going to take over the world. Corn, cotton, soybeans, wheat, canola. We didn't see a big market opportunity for, for herbicides. Thus, you don't see too many herbicides coming through. We've got some right at the top, but you have to go quite deep into that channel to find the next wave of herbicides. We looked at insecticides 15 to 20 years ago, and you think about where are the opportunities in insecticides. You've got BT cotton, you've got BT corn. So you're starting to get a little bit worried about what's my return on investment on chewing insecticides for lepidopterin control. So you skew your, your discovery to sucking insects or other insects, rasping insects, scales, mealybug. And lo and behold, most of the products that are coming out in the market at the moment are really targeting secondary pests, sucking insecticides, rasping insects, those types of things. Fungicides is open slather. Great opportunities in, in fungicides because there is no disruptive technology right now. That takes away the opportunity from fungicides. But really, this is about investing for the long term and trying to predict future, future opportunities. And it's not just chemistry. There are other platforms developing. Many of you would have read about biologicals. Companies are investing a lot of money into biologicals. Um, and there's other breakthrough technology coming through RNAi, which potentially has um, the capacity to undo resistance in some specific areas and some new applications. A quick look at um, our insecticides. I'm not going to go into detail on these. The thing I like about this is multiple pests across some of the key groups, the chewing, the thrips, sucking pests and others. But out of the six products, five modes of action. So that's really important for us in terms of resistance management and rotation and also being part of the wider industry IPM approach to be rotated with other products in the industry to protect the long-term sustainability of, of our products. And just to finish off, because it ties in nicely with, um, with the previous slides, uh, a new product that we've just launched is, is called Transform. Um, the active is, is isoclast. 15 years ago, we're looking for sucking insecticides, knowing that or assuming that the lepidopteran opportunity is, is limited. And um, we've been able to, we've been very fortunate to be able to launch this one. It's been launched around the world. It's not a neonicotinoid, it's a group 4C. Um, it's got some of the benefits that we talked about that are important today when looking for new chemistries in terms of it's selective to a couple of key pests, which is good for maintaining beneficials and, and IPM friendly. Looking at some work done in Australia, which is important to, um, to always look at local work, and we look at how this product performs locally against either um, tolerant pests, and in this case aphids, but also those that already have tested resistance to some other chemistries in this place, in, in this situation, the neonicotinoids. So here's some work done by the New, New, New South Wales DPI shows that sulfoxiflor is a different group, still affecting and controlling aphids very well, even those that are resistant to other insects. And this is a tool that's being used selectively very well across the country. The canola industry has taken this product um, and we believe is stewarding very well. It controls green peach aphid, which is a vector in the canola industry um, for, a, for a, a disease. Um, but we, we like what we see from the canola industries in southern Australia and not wanting to overuse this product. You might have read in the newspapers recently, Russian wheat aphid is seemingly just blown in from Africa and causing a lot of problems through southern um, Australian cereal markets. So when we look at a new, aphis, uh, new aphicide like we have, we need to be very careful and work with industry closely to make sure that, yes, we like to sell our product, but we need to manage it for the long term. And we work in collaboration with those industries to make sure stewardship programs are in place. And one of the other developments coming with this product is um, fruit spotted bug and, and avocados and macadamias. So um, you've now had 50 minutes of sexy talk about resistance management, um, but I hope you found that interesting at a, at a different level. But really the take home message here, I, I, I hope you take from this, and this is more of a corporate view of how companies like Dow looks at resistance management and how it really biases our behavior in terms of looking for new technologies, is 
From what we can see today in front of us, there are some great opportunities with new technologies. But in the short term, because of the challenges of developing and commercializing new products, there is going to be a challenge in the amount of options that you have. Right now, things look good, but we do believe that trend is going to continue to be low. So there's a real onus and responsibility on the industries through the farmers and through anyone who manages or consults to farmers to implement IPM programs and think about sustainable use of these products in the long term. So thank you very much.